You're listening to the Attempt Adventure Podcast, a podcast about finding adventure every day and making your life a little more interesting. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your host, James Barrett, joined always by my co-host, Michael DeRosiers from Bangkok, Thailand. How are you today, James? I am doing good. I am doing good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> I, I'm feeling a little bit off this morning. I, I, I'm mm. not sick, but I feel like I'm getting sick. Mm. And I feel like I will be sick in a day or two, but I'm okay right now. That's almost worse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, here's the thing. You, you know, James, I'm in graduate school, and the other night... I pulled my first all-nighter since probably my sophomore year of undergrad, and man, it was rough. <laughs> it was very rough. I, I struggled. I can't do this anymore. And the next, very next day, I had a, um, an excursion I had to go on for the National Museum, which required walking around outside in the heat and you know traveling by bus and, and just nonstop moving from point to point, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of worn out. Kind of worn out. So if I do get sick, that's probably why. <laughs> but I'm I'm trying very hard not to. I'm eating a lot of oranges. <laughs> that's always good. They say vitamin C helps you not get sick. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody to please participate in our monthly challenge. This month, the theme is coffee outside. So our monthly challenge asks you to go outdoors and make a cup of coffee. Or, or beverage of your choice, and you can interpret this any way you want. You can do this as simply or as elaborately as you prefer. Snap a photo, send it to us, hello at attemptadventure.com, or tag us on Instagram, hashtag attemptadventure. Mm-hmm. At the end of the month, we are going to choose our three favorites, and we're going to send you some very cool Attempt Adventure stickers, some exclusive merchandise that, at least as of right now, you can get nowhere else. <laughs> Except by winning our little games. <laughs> That's right. And we've actually already had a couple of entries. So Have we? Awesome. participate. Well, Michael, what did you do this week? Did you do anything new? Anything fun? I did. Well, that, uh, that excursion that I was telling you about was something brand new for me. So in my studies at the National Museum, which I talked about I think I might have mentioned it last week. I'm, I'm training at the mm-hmm. National Museum to be a volunteer guide in this very intensive six-month training course. Right now, we, we've just started a lecture series on prehistory and the Devavarti period, which is the earliest organized state in what we now think of as Thailand. It's, it's pre-Ayutthaya, pre-Sukhothai, pre-Khmer. Not much is known about the Devavarti, really. There, there's not ta- that many records from them, but we can... We can extrapolate some interesting information based on their artifacts. And so we took an excursion to the Utong National Museum. Utong is a district in, I believe, Supanburi province. It's just two and a half hours north of Bangkok, a bit west of Ayutthaya. But it's one of the greatest collections of Duvavarti art and artifacts. And they have a branch of the National Museum there that is dedicated to this time period. Hmm. And it was just, yeah, it was really cool. There's... There's a lot that we can learn about them, and you will know more about this than I will, based on your academic background in archaeology. But the way the cities were laid out, they had very round moats, but most of the temples and most of the residential areas were outside of the moats. Uh, and there was no, there's no artwork, at least no surviving artwork, that depicts war, violence, battles of any kind, as opposed to like Khmer artwork, which is showing lots of, lots of fighting, lots of battle scenes. From these things, we can kind of extrapolate that they probably weren't under that much external threat. They, they didn't seem to be engaged in any kind of warfare. It seems like it was a pretty mercantile empire. Hmm. Very prosperous. There was a lot of trade beads and trade currencies that they found. And fascinatingly, to me anyway, the only Roman coins ever found in Thailand were found um, in Utong. And there's a Roman coin that goes back to about year 200 or so, something like like around that era. That's cool. So I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying the Romans came here, but I'm saying it's evidence of trade. The Romans probably traded with the Persians, who traded with the Indians, who traded with the Burmese, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and it somehow made its way here, which is quite interesting. So we toured the galleries at the Utong branch of the National Museum, and then we went to an archaeological dig site where uh, many of the artifacts were found. So it was it was quite cool. So even though I had pulled an all nighter, I was really tired. I like I almost didn't go. But I, I forced myself to. We had to meet downtown to get on our bus at like 7 o'clock in the morning. I finished my project at like 
four, and I knew I had to wake up at five in order to get there. So it was <laughs> it was just a rough day, but it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. So it was it was cool. It was worth doing, even if it does get me a bit sick. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really cool. As all nighters go, it's crazy to me that I used to be able to just do them, like no issue. Just yeah, I used to be able to do one. And then get up and take an exam the next day. I know. Day. That was how I wrote every paper I ever wrote for college was the night before. I don't trust people that write their papers like oh, two weeks in advance. I'm not going to do it until I have to do it. <laughs> anyway. The class is called The Family in a Multicultural Context. And for this project, we had to analyze two episodes from two television sitcoms from two different decades. Hmm. And I won't get into the the family aspects that I analyzed, but I will say that one of the episodes that I analyzed was from The Munsters. I was sitting there at 3 a.m., and there's something I just couldn't get out of my mind, James. Hmm. Bear with me on this. Okay. I'm, I'm not even going to get into the fact that the offspring of a vampire and a Frankenstein's monster is a werewolf. That is irrelevant to this conversation. Right. But here's the thing. So Lily Munster is a vampire. Hmm. Grandpa Munster, her father, is also a vampire. So presumably their entire family are vampires. Marilyn is a regular human, which is part of the comedy of the show, okay? She is the daughter of Lily's sister. She should be a vampire, but she's not, and that's the joke, right? Why is she called Marilyn Munster? Surely Munster is Herman's name. Marilyn is Lily's sister's kid. She should be named something else entirely. Why is Grandpa Munster named Grandpa Munster? He's also just the father-in-law. He shouldn't be a Munster. Oh, my God. What's the God. deal with this, James? I was up at 3 a.m. pondering this, mm. trying to wrap my mind around this. Did Herman change his name? Because, I mean, if you look at Grandpa, he's wearing what appear to be Transylvanian medals. Is he a nobleman? Did Herman marry up and decide to change his name to Munster to 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 join a higher I class would, of family? I think, <laughs> I think that might be it. Because you would argue that... His name, his last name would be probably Frankenstein. You're right. This is valid. Okay. And so I think I, I'm going to go with um he he took her last name. He, he because they're, she's nobility. Yeah, and they're they're a very progressive family. You know, they obviously don't care about gender roles and things like that. They're a very progressive family. So I don't think he would have a problem with that. So I think I think that's probably it. Which would make which would make the rest of this make sense. That's the only way that all of this works. You know, the, I was sitting there at 3 a.m. procrastinating, and, and this just kept running in my head trying to figure this out, but that, that helps me. I mean, yeah. Did you prefer the Munsters or the Adams Family? Oh, the Munsters, definitely. I thought they were funnier. The joke was that they were trying to be a completely normal family, or that they thought they were a completely normal family. And, and yet they thought that Marilyn was the freak, and I always just thought that was really, really funny. Thank, thank you for listening to our Munsters rant. Yeah, I just had to work through some things. <laughs> he was distraught. <laughs> I was. It just didn't it just didn't make sense to me. But there we go. There's me imposing my own like cultural biases and my own yeah. gender roles on the family. Shame on me, right? That's true. I mean <laughs> I mean you he did marry up, let's be honest. Like with the Adams family, Gomez Adams and Morticia Adams, they're pretty equal. They're both some they're both some handsome people. In the Munsters, you got Lily Munster, who is Elvira, basically. And then you have Herman Munster, who looks like the big brother from Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Well, how about you? Yeah. <laughs> what, did you what did you do this week? <laughs> you had that great trip to the museum. Mine is a little weird, a little embarrassing. You know, as a kid, I skateboarded. The other day... I just got this itch. I was like, you know what? I'm going to skateboard again. So I tried. I was never very good. It was just fun. I'm worse now. And just in general. But I did it. I was embarrassed. I was nervous. You know, I'm a, I'm a big guy. I'm tall. I'm big. I look silly riding a skateboard. But it was fun. I haven't decided if I'm going to keep going with it or not. I might. It sounds, it sounds like it could be a fun thing. There's no reason to be embarrassed. I've never looked at somebody on a skateboard and thought, oh man, that's embarrassing. We put these things on ourselves. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't think I'm going to get to a point where I can do anything on it, but I just, riding around on it's fun. 
That's really cool. Is it kind of a coming back in trend in the U.S. It is. skateboarding? Uh huh. It is here as well. I've, I've seen a lot of people skateboarding in Bangkok just in the last three or four weeks. It's like a very welcoming, very like open. When when we were growing up, there was a lot of like gatekeeping with it. If you weren't good, then there were, why were you doing it? Like that kind of thing. And now it's more like anyone can do it. There's a lot of people like our age that either wanted to but didn't or whatever that are like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And, you know, I, I encourage that. So it's that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it has sort of swung back around because it was really, really big when we were growing up. That was the Tony Hawk era. Yeah, the Tony Hawk era. But now it's it's different. There's no real like prolific guy that's sort of over the whole thing. There's only ever been one prolific guy. That's true. Tony Hawk. Why not? You know, do what you enjoy. Do what's fun. That's sort of what my mind came to. It was like, yeah, people think you're going through like a midlife crisis, but who cares? But anyway, that's what I did. It was fun. I, I enjoyed it. It's harder than it used to be. I bet. But it's good exercise. It is. It is very good exercise. I got really tired really quick. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've gotten into something exciting just because you want to. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what made me do it. There was nobody, nobody was like, oh, you should try this or whatever. It was just me coming to the realization that it was like, you know what, let's, let's give that a shot. You want to just jump right into the to the meat, so to speak? And so to speak, speaking of meat, <laughs> well, today we're talking about food. Mm-hmm. We are talking about food. Two fat guys talking about food. When I'm traveling, one of the best things to do is to try new and interesting local food. Wherever you go in the world, everybody is proud of their local cuisine. And it's one of the best ways to connect with a culture to meet people, and to learn about the country's history and values is through their food. That is very, very true. Yeah, I've never been somewhere where they didn't want to feed you. (laughs) No. (laughs) Like, please don't try our cuisine. (laughs) Like, please don't. It's boring. (laughs) And I think that food and eating together and sharing food is just such a big part of every culture, Mm -hmm. no matter where you are. Yeah, it's important. And it's important to try things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. If it's available, I try and eat at local places, wherever I go, whether that's in Thailand or it's in Colorado. I try and eat at local places because that's how you really get to know what the area is about, what's going on. I can tell you the best food that I have had in Thailand wasn't at a restaurant. It was when we went to the Erewhon Shrine. Erewhon Shrine? The shrine. And they have the vendors and stuff there. That was the best papaya salad, and that was the best food that I've had in Thailand. And I don't know if it really was, or if it's just it was the best memory. Because locale has something to do with it as well. I remember those noodle soups on Koh Larn very fondly, because it was a good (laughs) time. Were they very good? Probably not. Well, they were instant, weren't they? They were instant noodles because we had like $8. But we had an incredible view looking back out over the Gulf of Thailand. Oh yeah, it was a beautiful view, beautiful hotel. We had enough money for beer and that was the main point. You know, the best fried chicken I've ever had is from a street vendor in Thailand. No, and I've been searching to recreate it ever since and you can't. But you really do need to experience what the locals eat. It kind of goes back to just travel in general, don't only hang out with other tourists. And don't don't only eat at Burger King. I mean, (laughs) like I've said before in this podcast and our previous ones, the one restaurant that you have to go to in every country you go is McDonald's. Yeah, and I think that's a good place to start here, to start our discussion today, because McDonald's adapts their menu to every country. What have you had... At McDonald's. Now, so Ooh. when you go to an American fast food chain in another country, what you can find is just a little bit different, but it's a very easy way to ease yourself into mm-hmm. the country because it's still, it's manageable. It's not scary. It's not intimidating. It doesn't have to be specifically McDonald's, but what local versions of fast food have you had on your travels? All right. Let's see here. One, 
McDonald's in other countries is so much better than McDonald's in America. And don't get me wrong, I love me some McDonald's in America. There are two restaurants that everyone says they hate, but everybody actually likes, and that's McDonald's and Taco Bell. Okay, let's see. I have had the McWings. They have, like, the fried the fried chicken that's the actual chicken. I've had those. I've had... I have had their chicken rice, and I've had their um, caprao pork rice. That's so good. It's so good. Really good. <laughs> I always got weird stuff. I think the best thing to me about at least Thailand McDonald's is that for the most part, like all the sandwiches and stuff like that are healthier, but then they have like quadruple XL French fries and it's hilarious. No, I, I do recommend that. I always go to McDonald's anytime I go to a new country. Yeah. And, and you should. Yeah. It's fun. I mean, in Hong Kong, I had the McDonald's version of Hong Kong milk tea. In Malaysia, I've had a green curry chicken. Like Taco Bell opened up in Thailand last year, but they don't serve beef because most Thai people just don't eat beef. Hmm. It's not a part of the cuisine here. People don't don't care for beef. So they have a lot of pork tacos. I mean, they have to adapt it to the country's tastes. It's not just that. I mean, I, I agree with you that I think that's a good place to start if maybe you're a little nervous about whether you're going to like the food. If you're If you're nervous about eating street food, which a lot of Americans are at first. But that's the best place to eat. It is. And here's a, a fun recommendation. If you're in Thailand, go to Dairy Queen and get the Mango Blizzard. Mm, it is really, really good. I enjoy going to Swinson's. We have an ice cream shop. Yes. There. Love and Swinson's. I, I like to get the regular the regular ice cream there. But I like to also send you a picture whenever they have a strange one. Because I think <laughs> you and I both find it hilarious. And I sent you a picture the other day and... Um, and you were as surprised as I was. It was the, I forget what it was called. It was like the watermelon Hold and on. fish sundae. Yeah. Or something like, ridiculous. <laughs> let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay. Yeah, last was... year they came out with one that was a young mango and shrimp. And I actually got that. But this one, I took a picture. I have not tried it yet, but I, I sent it to you, James. Yep. Watermelon dried fish sundae. Yeah, right. Only 159 baht. That's about five bucks. That's pretty good. Yeah, it comes with watermelon balls. It comes with watermelon ice cream. A bunch of dried fish on the top. And what I'm guessing is pandan rice on the side. <laughs> and it's probably got fish sauce in there somewhere, too. I just don't quite understand. Now, and I've we've been to Swinson's more times than I think I would like to admit. Uh -huh. It's super good. And I don't care that it's an American restaurant. It's super good ice cream. It is. I mean, when you're walking around in Bangkok, oh, man. it's like 40 degrees Celsius outside. I have been in there. We've been in there when it was packed with locals. We've been in there no matter what. Not a single person is eating the weird ones. I don't think anybody is eating them. I, I, are they more gimmicks? I don't know. Is it like, I, it's I fun. When I, when, I ordered, when I ordered that shrimp one, they were kind of like, really? <laughs> like, no one has <laughs> ever ordered seen. this. Fish for dessert is wrong. I'm sorry. Fish for breakfast is hard for me to get by, too. I, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's one of the few things that you haven't been able to mentally break through. It's true. Like, in, in Thailand, there's not much distinction between breakfast food, lunch food, and dinner food. You, you pretty much eat whatever you want, whenever you want, which is fine, typically. Fish, yeah, fish, I like fish, but I, I can't have it for breakfast. I mean, sometimes you can get like a fish, or like a rice porridge. Uh, I never get fish in mine. I always get, you know, pork or or shrimp. Mm -hmm. Shrimp even. I'm fine with shrimp for breakfast, but just not fish. Not yet. Because Americans are super big on breakfast. Mm -hmm. Americans love our breakfast food. But Asian countries, typically it's, you either eat what was left over, or it's like a rice porridge with, some meat or soup. I have never been able, I've tried, but the soup for breakfast is super weird. Now, is cereal a soup? Um, yes. By definition, <laughs> yes, I think it is. I'm going to come out and say it, yes. It's like a gazpacho. Mm hmm, mm hmm. But anyway, we're, this, is a, this is a little more rambly one. This is, this is a very ear goggles <laughs> type of podcast today, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Ooh. Okay, let's 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 sort of get back on track here. What is like when you think of your best food experience, what comes to mind? 
I can think of a time period specifically that comes to mind. It wasn't that the food was even the most spectacular food, but it was just that this was a time period where we were specifically focused on food. It was when um, my fiance and I uh, moved to Vietnam for a while. We couldn't cook for ourselves. The most we could make for ourselves in that period, because we were staying at hostels, was um, instant noodles or like bread with peanut butter. So we ate out a lot. Um, at one point, we were staying in a local homestay, and the family there served us breakfast every morning. They would just go out to some local street food shop and get us some breakfast and bring it back. And it was really fun, and it was so much fun to, to eat this great local food that we even started a side project, a blog, which I want to shout out, theworldofstreetfood.com. I've been working on that for about three years, not every day. Whenever I eat anything that I especially enjoy, we post on there, usually with a little map where to find it, a link to a Google, Google map where to find it, and just some pictures, really. But it's just been a fun way to kind of document, and I like going back through it and remembering what I've had. See, I've never, I've never seen this. I just pulled it up. Mm, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't post on it all the time, but it's a project I enjoy. It's probably the project I like doing the most because it means I've gotten to try a lot of really good food. Cool. That's really cool. This is fun. So it wasn't one specific dish, but it was that time period. And if you kind of go back on the blog to the okay. 2018 times, you can see a lot of very good Vietnamese food that I was enjoying in my travels there. Quite fun. Um... So it's not quite one dish. If I'm going to go for one dish, I think one of the most interesting experiences I've had was, well, last year during the COVID times when there were no tourists and there still are no tourists, I was finally able to go to J. Fai's restaurant. J. Fai is this, mm. uh, I believe, the first Michelin-starred street food restaurant, certainly in yes, Bangkok, maybe in, duck, maybe in right? the world. No, she makes the crab omelets. And if you've seen a documentary oh, yes, about yes, yes. Thailand, especially a food documentary, you've probably seen her. She wears giant goggles to keep, like, chili smoke out of her eyes. She cooks on a walk. Her food is kind of expensive, and normally you have to wait two or three hours to get a seat in her restaurant. But we were able to go during COVID when there's no one here, and we only had to wait, like, maybe 30 minutes. She sells huge portions, really, really high-quality food, excellent food. So I think if I had to choose one experience, probably hers, just because it's iconic and it's very difficult to get in generally. And it was re it was good. Mm -hmm. It was good. It was a very expensive <laughs> for street food, but really, really fun. Quite an enjoyable experience all around. What about you? What are some of your best food experiences? I did really enjoy at the Erewhon Shrine, and I don't remember what it was called. Let me see if I can find a picture and you can tell me. Ah, that is, yes, Khao uh, Klu I think is what it's called. It's it's a mixed dish. So that's actually, yeah, yeah, that's, um, it's a mixed dish. It's got dried shrimp and, like, all sorts of vegetables mm -hmm. and uh, sweet pork and stuff like that. You just kind of mix it all together. Super good. But, yeah, so that sticks out to me. Other than that... It's like silly things. It's not necessarily the best food, like the Snoppy restaurant. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, that's just a regular restaurant. But for like you and me, it's a very special place. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you tell our <laughs> listeners why we find the Snoppy restaurant so enjoy or why we call it the Snoppy restaurant. <laughs> this is a some 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 Tom some some Tom restaurant, which is papaya salad. Mm -hmm. It's just in a mall in downtown Bangkok. It's not the best restaurant. It's pretty good. It's not the best. It's kind of pricey. It's just a restaurant. The first time I came to Thailand, we we spent the day going to so many temples and so many... The Grand Palace, and we were just sightseeing all day off, off of like one hour of sleep. And by the time we stopped for lunch, you and I were both just dying we we couldn't think straight we couldn't do anything so we sat down in the restaurant and the restaurant has little drawings that people will draw on and put on the wall right there mm -hmm. and we were sitting at our table and we look over and it's a <laughs> crudely drawn snoopy but it's it just says snoppy <laughs> s-n-o-p-p-y for our punch drunk minds that was the funniest thing that had ever happened to anybody 
and since then we we've gone back every time i've been there and it's still funny yeah it's still there too and it's still there i'll keep going back every time you're in town as long as that snoppy picture is still hanging on the wall yeah and you know the best food experiences aren't always the michelin star restaurants they're not always it's like that little coffee shop on the way up Golden Mount. Mm -hmm. It's not even that good. But we always get a tea every time. But we always get a tea, and it's great. Food is more about making memories than it is the actual food. It, it's, yeah, I think, I think... It's the feelings, the emotions, the memories, mm -hmm. the context around what you're eating that yeah. makes it feel important and special. So... We've talked about the best food we've ever had. What's the weirdest food you've ever had? Yeah, weirdest is, it's interesting. It's hard to define at times. Um, and mm -hmm. it is, of, course, of course, it's subjective. I mean, what I find weird wouldn't be weird to other cultures. But um, here in Thailand, there's a lot of foods that I still don't, don't go for. I mean, I don't generally eat anything with uh, intestines in it, which, which you'll find here. Um, I don't eat tongue, cow tongue. Because I uh, I used to I didn't know what it was I used to eat it at school the school cafeteria I thought it was pretty good until one day I scooped a bit and it hadn't been cut properly and it was just like an actual tongue um, complete with taste buds <laughs> on it and after that I could never eat it again. Um, <laughs> but the weirdest food I've had the weirdest food I've had that's that's very hard to to say I think probably insects probably that time that you and I had mm -hmm. the um, the fried insects as a snack. And Which that are was, not good. That was just a snack I bought at Seven Eleven in the in the chips aisle. It wasn't like a specialty restaurant or even a thing that was for tourists, like you find like fried bugs on on Khao San Road. You can find like fried crickets and stuff. It wasn't like that. It was just at the convenience store with the potato chips, just a little bag of fried insects. And they were not very good. They were what were they? Silkworm cocoons, weren't they? Silkworms, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -uh. Food of the future, though. Next time you're is in it? town, I want to take you to that uh, that insect, that fine dining insect restaurant. Oh yeah, Give we couldn't convince <laughs> we couldn't convince our ladies to go. No, we couldn't. We were gonna go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think at one point we were even like, well, well, you and I will go, and then you two can go get dinner somewhere else. But it was just like <laughs> it was kind of far away. It was gonna be like an hour long round trip. And we're like, no, oh, that's mm -hmm. kind of too far just for a joke. Because <laughs> it, it was going to be an expensive joke. Because we weren't really going to enjoy it. I still want to go, though. Y yeah. Yeah, the bugs are up there. Blood. I'm not a fan of blood. It's not even like it tastes bad. It's just your brain doesn't want to do it. No, it's just this ferric lump. <laughs> yeah, because when you get chicken rice, it's got the rice, it's got the chicken, and but then it has a cube of blood for mm -hmm. some reason. I never eat it. I've eaten that cube of blood twice because the first time I was like, I got to do it. The second time I was like, maybe I'll like it this time. Both times were a no. <laughs> but you tried it. And that's, that's important. Whenever you're traveling, you just got to try. Stuff. I will try anything. That's sort of my goal is like, I will, I will try anything. Mm -hmm. And there are like silly foods that I don't like, like olives. I can't stand olives, but I'm perfectly fine with like, oh, look at this cube of blood popping on out. <laughs> like, I don't, so I don't understand that. We might have to have another episode on food I think where we, we really will. sit sit down and um, think about it a little more because I don't, I didn't do a ton of thinking about it. I thought it would just kind of flow, but yeah. there's, I've had a lot of experiences. Yeah, well, let's um, let's talk about how we prepare food when we're traveling. Then we're not just a travel podcast; we're an adventure podcast. And that comes down to not just traveling, but camping, hiking, backpacking. So mm -hmm. when I'm traveling, I'm typically staying at cheap hotels. Sometimes they have a water kettle. Sometimes they don't. I don't always eat out. A lot of times I'll be eating, yeah, instant noodles or instant rice porridge. I usually get some peanut butter and carry it with me, peanut butter and bread or something like that, just to have something filling for if I'm hungry in the day or if I don't, <laughs> don't want to spend money. Mm -hmm. That's my camping on the road. Have you ever done any like hotel cooking where you cook in their coffee pot or on their iron or whatever? Have you ever done that? I've seen this on YouTube. Not really. I've done like instant noodles. I've done 
microwave foods. I've done stuff like that. But I have eaten whole trips out of, like, a mini fridge. Like, for me, if I'm not eating out, I typically just don't feel like doing anything. Yeah. So I always try and grab, like, stuff to make some sandwiches or, like, some Lunchables or things like that. Just quick and easy. So for traveling like that, I typically try and do that kind of thing. Since I typically don't trust, like, water kettles at hotels. Since... I just don't. I keep planning on doing hotel cooking, and I really want to, like, see what I can do. <laughs> yeah. That might be a fun thing to do next time I'm in town. We can try to have a whole yeah. meal, a whole feast in a hotel. Yeah, and so I think I want to do that for sure. But as for, like, traveling, I cooking while, like, camping is much more interesting. Okay. Yeah, because when you're traveling, you're basically either eating at a restaurant or out of a gas station or a convenience store, and... and James, you and I are planning a trip to Japan in the nebulous future when the world once again allows travel. And when we're there, we're going to be eating out of the convenience stores a lot because eating at a regular restaurant is a bit pricey Mm -hmm. in the old land of the rising sun. And so what you do is you eat out of their convenience stores, and they're good. Stuff is more convenient when you're traveling, but what if you're like climbing a mountain? What if you're on a trail or just car camping in general? What do you like to make on your outdoors adventures on your your camping trips freeze-dried food is great if you're like backpacking or things like that if you have a car and are able to have a cooler i'm a big fan of of the hot dogs you can't you can't beat a camping hot dog no or hobo burgers where you put the meat and the vegetables in the foil and you just put those in the fire can't beat those like some people go all out and they want to like grill steaks and they want to like do all this other stuff and i'm just like just give me a hot dog and I'm good. Some beans, some like hot dogs and beans. Can't beat it. That's great. You know, I, I told you, I don't remember if we talked about this on the other show or not, but uh, over Christmas I went camping at a national park not too far away, and I was cooking some pretty elaborate food. I made a sweet potato and chorizo hash one day, which was excellent. Hmm. And then like on my second or third day, I came back from a hiking trip, and I found that a monkey had gotten into my cooler in fact it was still there eating my food and the park rangers were trying to throw things at it and it just was undeterred and it it ruined most of my food it took like one bite out of everything i had and then dropped it back into the cooler (laughs) ruining everything and rendering everything inedible (laughs) so for the first half of my trip i ate really well doing a lot of camp cooking and for the second half of my trip i was eating a lot of instant noodles and crackers and stuff from the camp store (laughs) and both are good they are they're equally good when you're camping you don't even have to cook If you brought, like, some summer sausage and some cheese, you're good to go. You know, I I keep planning on... My fiancé and I were supposed to go camping this month, but we're we're, we're planning a move, and so I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But I'm really... That'll be a lot of fun, Mm -hmm. because she's never been. And she's going to learn that camping isn't fun while you're doing it. Camping is fun later. It's type 2 fun. Yes. Got to do this right, James. This is important. This is a make-or-break moment. I mean, mm-hmm. when I took my fiance camping for the first time, things didn't go well. She was very, I was very lucky that she was um, so open-minded and willing to try again because our gear wasn't good. It rained. We we got stuck. Man, and if you if you have if you take someone camping for the first time and it's awful, they will never camp again. I was so proud of her because I was afraid that was going to be it. That she was just going to say, you know, this is not for me. But as soon as we got our tent set up under the little shelter in the gu- in the guides or the ranger station, she just started browsing the internet trying to find us a better tint. You know, she was just nice. all, all looking for better gear, and I was like, I appreciate that. She's willing to try it again. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been camping a couple times here since then. So so it's important, James. It's very important that you do a good job. You have a duty as a, mm-hmm. as a good fiancé to do this. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's sort of my next thing. I'm, I'm working on planning on it. Hopefully I can st- we can still go this month before it gets too hot, because mm-hmm. if, go if you don't go in April... You're not going until... Like October, November. Winter, yeah. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry that that this episode is a bit, like, rushed at the end. Uh, uh, I don't know what happened. We spent, like, half an hour talking about the Munsters, and we've probably cut most of that (laughs) out. Um, We just got off-topic today, and I'm sorry about that, but that's what happens sometimes. And if you liked our off-topic chat, again, check us out on Ear Goggles, where you can find a lot more of that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I will say that back in the day... 
James and I made a series of videos called Snack Time Asia. It was one of our first forays into content creation. And I'm going to upload those old videos onto our YouTube channel yes. so you guys can see us eating insects and other things on our travels in Thailand and New Mexico. <laughs> Very different places. Okay, well, James, it's time for our favorite segment, Adventures in the News. And this week, it is your turn to find us an adventure. It what is. have you got for us, my friend? The title is Volunteers Seal Themselves Inside a French Cave for 40 Days in a Deep Time Experiment. Huh, that sounds very sci-fi. What is this? Basically, it's to study the effects on the psyche and thing in the brain and things like that for prolonged periods mm. of isolation, but like doing work it's, it says it will provide invaluable data for submarine missions, mining expeditions and space travel. Oh, it's more about it's, it's, it's basically to study how the human brain and body processes the passage of time without gauges for it. So they don't have watches. They can't see the sun. They can't do anything. So it's 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 about how humans process the passage of time without being able to see the passage of that is time. Fascinating. That is fascinating because that's a big issue. I know that one of the major issues that they're contending with in the Mars missions are the fact that people are going to be isolated for a number of months with like three mm -hmm. or four people just just alone. Um, and obviously days are going to be structured differently. And I think that they are really concerned about their mental health and well-being in that time. Yeah. And so this is a really interesting article. We won't get, it's pretty long. So we'll, we'll post a link to it if oh, anyone yeah, wants to certainly. read it, but it's, it's very interesting and it's definitely something that I want to read more about. So um, as, as usual, guys, if you want to read the articles that we're talking about, you can always go to our website, attemptadventure.com, and click on the Episodes button and find our show notes. And we always link our Adventures in the News articles right there in our show notes. And so that's where you can mm -hmm. find us. That is, that is interesting stuff, James. I, I wouldn't do it. I don't like being no. isolated that much, but someone has to do it. I mean, it's for the future of humanity. Yeah, and it's a group of 15 people. 40 days. Wow, they, ha they have a pedal-driven generator. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Well, I, I, I will be curious to see how this turns out. Yeah. Maybe we can try to find an update on them in the future. I'm going to keep an eye out for that because it sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, it really does. It's like that Biosphere 2 that they built out in Arizona, like in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think that they managed very well at Biosphere 2, and they had, like gardens and and biomes and stuff so i don't know how they're going to do in a cave we'll find out <laughs> yeah and they've been provided with food and equipment but we'll have to harvest any water from the cave oh gross cave water sounds a bit scary but i think it'd be an interesting time so uh ladies and gentlemen if you would participate in such an experiment let us know uh, i wouldn't i'll go on record right here saying that i wouldn't do it i don't think i would no enjoy those 40 days very much no, I would not. <laughs> yeah, if we will post a post a link to this article on our on the on the website, so go check it out. Tell yeah. us what you think. Well, very good. Thank you, James. Well, we're going to finish this conversation next time with a bit more in depth and a bit more better researched information for you. So come back next week for more international and adventurous foods. Until then, don't forget to continue participating in our outdoor coffee monthly challenge. Hashtag attempt adventure. You can also email us. Hello at AttemptAdventure.com. Find us on our website, AttemptAdventure.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, where we are Attempt Adventure on all of them. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, we're on, we're on all of them. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Until next time, keep adventuring. Remember that weird one, the movie, 
Do you remember the movie they mm-hmm. made that was just in color and everything was wrong? Yeah, there was also one abomination called The Munsters Today or something like that that came out in the 80s. And it looks like the SNL parody of The Munsters. And it's just Oh my horrifying. god, that's awful. Did you find it? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't that look like something you'd see on Saturday Night Live? It ran for four years. Yeah. Wow, we've been talking for 15 minutes about the Munsters. <laughs> for more... We will cut some of that. <laughs> yeah, for more for more random chat like this, please go check out our other podcast, um, Ear yeah. Goggles. It's, That's right. We, we just ramble to each other. And if you want to join our just off-topic conversations, that's where you can find it. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more unstructured, a lot more just random. 